Hello everyone. I am super excited for this webinar. I cannot even begin. Um, I'm excited and nervous because there's a lot going on and I'm super um, anxious to see and hear all of the ambassadors and awesome people who are about to share um, some tools, testimonies, and resources um, about leading and being part of the movement on how to be advo an advocate for sustainable cities, even in the time of COVID. If you are tuning in right now, I hope you can let us know which city are you in at the comment section. Um, you can see it on the live stream. We would definitely appreciate it if you could also share this live stream on your feed. The more, the merrier, of course. And if at any point of the webinar you have any particular questions or comments, feel free to share them on the comment section and we will be able to address them for you either during this moderation in the webinar itself or through the comment section also after the event. So welcome. This is the webinar on how to advocate for sustainable cities. If you are new to the game, um, if you're new to the webinar or Make Sense TV, um, please flood the stream um, for of hearts and like reacts, even carry acts if it still exists on your mobile or your desktop. And we would really, really love it if you could let us know where you are in right now. Which city are you tuning in from? My name is Anjali. I am currently the Startup Incubation Director of Make Sense and happily your guide tonight. If you could humor me for just a couple of minutes and pretend that I am a genie, what if I can tell you that I am a genie that can grant your wishes um, if it's pertaining to the ideal city of your choice. Tell me, what does the ideal city look like to you? Comment it on the live stream thread and you never know, maybe I am a genie and maybe I can actually grant it. I'll give you a couple of seconds to do this. Checking the live stream now. Hello everyone, QC, lots of people. <laughs> the ideal city is walkable. Thank you for that comment. What else? What does the ideal city look like to you? No wrong answers here, guys. Green, cyclable. <laughs> Something that looks like an animal crossing island. Wow, Ex that is exceptional. <laughs> I would love that as well. A city that is not um, impenetrable for COVID. Excellent. That is definitely like um, a Wakanda, I think. <laughs> Clean and light traffic. Oh, I want that too. Efficient public transportation. Oh my gosh. Keep them coming, guys. You never know. There might be a genie listening in on this thread or looking at your comments and we never know it might come true Keep, oh my gosh <laughs> no more homelessness yes excellent thank you so much um keep them coming um i would definitely love to see what ideal city looks like to you i mean i think how the ideal city looks like depends on who you ask if it was up to me entirely, I would say that the ideal city is one with green parks, obviously. Um, like a lot of you already said on the comment thread. Something with benches and um, nice breathable air where I can just sit and read a book. Maybe a place where there is also an organic market, not just during Sundays or um, in well-off villages. <laughs> if you ask my dad, uh, which I did a couple of days ago, he said that the ideal city is um, pretty much like um, a, the place that he grew up in, wherein there's not a lot of buildings, a view of the mountain, you can feel the dirt, and you can say hi to your neighbors that you actually um, come across with. But if you ask people who are very much used to the urban jungle, um, if you ask real estate owners, for example, or um, people who are very used to the metro lifestyle, they will say that an ideal city is one that has very good and affordable condominium units, um, nice view to the city, 
you can see some greens and some blues and um, of course a lot of establishments that are very very cool now if you ask kids um, they will say that ah there must be playgrounds there should be um, places where they can run meet new friends and play with them and also maybe a pool with a big a huge water slide or something <laughs> If you ask um, our fellow countrymen who live in the neighboring provinces who are very much near in the metro cities and they're, for example, working in the metro cities for something that you've already said in the comment thread, which is uh, an accessible and the proper transportation system that can take them from their home to their workplace in the metro and then back to their home in a reasonable amount of time and cost. But if you ask our Kababayan, who has always lived um, with a wheelchair, for example, they might ask for roads that are smooth, that are wheelchair-friendly, and maybe some ramps uh, that can make establishments accessible to them. And it's very different if you also ask um, our fellow countrymen who earn only 200 pesos income per day, for example, they wouldn't ask for water slides or green parks or organ organic markets. They will ask for something basic and I have to admit something that I usually take for granted, which is access to basic needs such as water, energy, and decent housing that is within their financial reach. How the ideal city looks like depends on who you ask. And who we ask gets to be taken into consideration on how we build the cities. Now, when you think about asking kids and the youth, much like yourself, um, about how to build the ideal city, it seems funny, but I have to tell you there's a lot of wisdom in this. According to Mara Mintzer, um, a world renowned urban planner, um, in her TED Talk, she said that the youth are the most inclusive designers. They design for everyone, from their grandparents to the homeless people they see on the streets. They're very empathic and very compassionate. The youth, much like you or us, <laughs> I, I would like to count myself in the youth still, um, we design for all living creatures, not just for cars, corporations, or egos. Just look at how our metro cities are like now. There's a huge difference, or at least a very visible difference, between the areas that are well off and the areas that are relatively poor. The Manila that we know, for example, um, has been built based on the objective of rapid economic growth above all else. You'll notice that free public services are available in areas that can afford it, um, the areas that can make money, which makes most of the poor areas an outsider for any quality public service. We have crazy traffic. It looks like a parking lot uh, most of the time. We have bad pollution. We have um, really bad waste management systems um, in most areas. And all of this, if you combine them, result to an acceleration of climate change. The gap between those who can live in the rich parts of the city versus those who are forced to live outside it, outside it rather, is undeniable, only magnified now that we are living through the pandemic of COVID crisis. Public services such as energy access, transportation, or waste management are usually efficient in areas where there are people who can afford it, like the upper to middle class. But those who live um, in poor areas um, are basically having um, a very difficult time to access good services and it makes them more vulnerable to this pandemic and other natural disasters as well. We can see that we are living in cities that are not designed to value each and every member equally, sadly. Case in point, our frontliners. We know of our health workers, of course. We applaud them, we support them as much as we can because they deserve, they deserve it, right? Like they save our lives if ever and whenever we are in trouble, um, especially in this COVID crisis. But how about our invisible frontliners, our kuyas who are collecting our garbage now that we are um, always at home, or the bank employees who keep the banks going so that we can have mon monetary transactions even if the COVID crisis on is ongoing. 
even the food delivery crew or the grocery store keepers, for example. Who takes care of them? The unsettling truth is that the invisible frontliners who help us stay safe and live a relatively comfortable life, they are often from the low-income communities. They struggle the most with the sanitarian and humanitarian crisis. We talk about the new normal and at least for my immediate circle, and I'm not saying that this is true for all, but it usually connotes staying home, working from home, work um, with your laptop and baking sourdough bread for the first time, posting it on Instagram while we watch the news on our Facebook feed because who watches the news on the TV nowadays? We see and hear stories of our fellow countrymen walking miles and miles just for an opportunity to get a daily wage or financial aid. Or maybe even stories about how our modern day heroes and frontliners are struggling um, one way or another. This cannot be it. If this is the new normal, then we need to start working towards a better normal. And to do that, we have to get the basics done right. The basics done right. Studies demonstrate that building sustainable and inclusive cities is one of the best ways to resolve and prevent a crisis much like this one. And this is where efforts and programs like the Youth for Sustainable Cities come in. I am very excited to introduce to you this event, um, and even more so, some of the people who are involved in the program right now, of course, in partnership with City Foundation, um, makes sense, is mobilizing youth advocates and social entrepreneurs to take action in urban living and sustainability. For more than five years now, um, at least here in the Philippines, Make Sense has utilized the power of communities, forward-thinking corporates um, like City Foundation and entrepreneurs to make a positive impact on society. The Youth for Sustainable Cities program, or Y4SC, um, has already started even before the pandemic, in fairness to City Foundation. Um, they already mobilized um, alongside Make Sense this program, even before COVID-19 hit. And this is particularly because we believe that the Filipino youth is already conscious and has the power um, to make a difference. We are conscious of the importance of building inclusive and sustainable cities for our country's progress. The only difference is that uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, this advocacy is not just important anymore. It's also urgent. I am honored and excited, very, very excited to introduce to you some of the awesome people behind and in the program right now. Um, in this webinar, we are not only celebrating the ambassadors and honoring them, um, we're not only um, talking about the progress of the startups that are in the academy right now um, in, in the Y4SC team. We're also sharing with you their stories and some resources and tips related to the Sustainable Cities Advocacy in the hopes of inspiring you to take part in this social action. It is only when everyone is asked and taken into consideration can we build inclusive and truly sustainable cities that we need and deserve as Filipinos. Without further ado, I would like to show you the roadmap for tonight's show. We are taking you through the Youth for Sustainable Cities or Y4SC Roadshow um, to meet some of the inspiring and brilliant ambassadors that we have from Dumaguete, Cebu, and Manila, moderated by our fellow Make Sense team members. Um, after that, we may be able to entertain some of your questions that are directed to them. So please, um, as a reminder, write in your comments and questions um, on the Facebook comment thread below. After we go through the um, reenactment, if I must say, uh, of the roadshow and checking in on the ambassadors and what they're doing right now, we will be featuring Siliksik and Tabang, two of the Y4SC social entrepreneurs, um, and checking in on their progress and how we can help them um, be more successful um, in this world today and how we can help them build sustainable cities with us. And definitely not the least, finally, we will have Keisha of Life Cycles PH to do an informative and inspirational talk at around 7.40 p.m. to close the show. Now, 
Before I pass um, the mic to our first moderator, um, please note the following. Do flood the stream with hearts in lieu of a warm round of applause for our speakers. Send your questions in through the comments section of our Facebook live stream. And again, as a note, we'll be able to take around three to five questions after the panels, the three panels, depending on the time we have left. But no worries, even if we don't have the time for the moderation tonight, we will be able to answer them in the comment section after the event. So moderating the Dumaguete um, Y4 SE Ambassadors Pan for our community development queen, it makes sense. Um, Pepper, if you could turn on your mic and video, please, so that you can um, introduce the panelists for Dumaguete. Very happy to. Thank you so much, Ange. Hello and good evening to everyone who's tuned in right now in our live stream. So my name is Pepper, obviously. I am the Asia Community Developer for Make Sense. And really, I'm so happy to be here to moderate our first panel of the night. The Youth for Sustainable Cities program and roadshow has been so impactful and so exciting, believe me, and is really one of the projects that I am truly most proud of as a community developer, especially because of the amazing young change makers who are part of it. It's really them, the community who make up this program and who make this program a success. So speaking of, and without further ado, I'm very excited to welcome today our two first two amazing ambassadors whom I've had the pleasure of meeting, of training, and also working with since this January, the start of this year. So meeting these two people, as you can see in the screen, um, meeting these two people, these two ambassadors has been such a joy uh, because especially of their energy and sincerity, which I'm sure you guys, our viewers for tonight, will feel even digitally. And for those of you guys who are tuned in from Dumaguete City, just like our two ambassadors for tonight, Maayong Gabi sa inyong tanan, please do leave us any love, react, heart react in the comments section. We'd be happy to see it uh, in lieu of the round of applause. So for today, as you can see here, we do have two people with us. We have Al Kaiser, who is an incoming senior studying civil engineering in Sediman University, while we also have Francis, who is a mass communication sophomore also studying in Sediman University. Both of these two young people have been such amazing and active ambassadors in the Youth for Sustainable Cities program since the start of the year. So, all right, welcome today, Francis and Al. Are you both feeling well? Are you excited? Mayang gabi, Pepper. Hi, Al. Good evening. Hi, Francis. All right, Good thank evening. you guys. Hi. Good evening, Mayang gabi. All right, so for today, <laughs> let's start from the very beginning, of course, the, the beginning when you both joined the Youth for Sustainable Cities program, because I know that individually, you guys have your own advocacies, different things that you were engaged with even beforehand. So for example, I know that you, Francis, you've been very involved with and very passionate about sustainable tourism, uh, culture, while you, Al, have always been very active on advocating for well-planned urban uh, cities. This is something that you feel very strongly about. So knowing that you both have already been very active youth advocates beforehand, even before the program, what really interested you to be part of the program? Was it was it the trainings when you saw the post? Was it you know knowing that you would meet fellow change makers? Um, what was it that got you to join and say, hey, I want to be part of this community? And maybe for this, we can start with Al. Okay, um, Mayong Gabi to everyone who are watching. So um, I joined the Y4SC program because um, for me, it was the best fit for my advocacy, which is building uh, sustainable cities and creating inclusive communities. Um, so yes, Pepper. Awesome. I'm glad to see that. I'm glad to hear that it really was a best fit. And I hope you still share that sentiment to this day months after. And how about you, Francis? What got you into the program? <laughs> well, actually, good evening, everyone. Um, even though I have many reasons in mind, but what I think for as of the moment, because before I was just actually invited with my organi organization, the New Ground Events and the Gaban Youth Kit. And they told me, oh, why don't we have to try this one? And then I tried it and I was amazed with everything that the mixing is offering. 
And then I connected it to my advocacy, which is focused on the journalism and tourism. And then later on, I realized that the stories really matter. So far, that's right. Thank you so much for sharing. I think you both share the same sentiment, even if you have different advocacies. It, it is something very related or very connected to what you guys were doing beforehand. And it was the best fit, as Al puts it. So thanks for that. I'm yes. very happy to, that you guys joined and that I got to meet you guys. Really, it was a joy. <laughs> um, so now all of these things that happen in Youth for Sustainable <laughs> Cities, the road show, the training, the many events that we organized, these all happened earlier this year, actually, from January to March, right? We were doing it together, it was so much fun. But obviously, a lot has happened since then, <laughs> just a couple of months in between, right? Especially once the COVID crisis hit. And I know that this is not just between us. I mean, all organizations are feeling this and all mm -hmm. advocates are. So I guess um, my, my next question for you both would be, what would uh, you say has changed in your both your mm. personal lives, but also as youth advocates yourself? You both are very active in this field, in this ecosystem. So when the COVID crisis hit, what were some things that you felt, you know, were there a lot of events or programs that stopped? Did change making, beco change making become more difficult, for example? Uh, Francis, let's start with you this time. Yeah, okay. Well, to be honest, Ms. Pepper, there's really a lot of changes happened since the COVID crisis um, hit. So from the personal life stories of mine, supposed routines, my travels and activities and even my works, like actually I go to far flung places or communities just to visit communities. Then, however, I really try to make things out during this pandemic. I made my time and activities at the same time on what I used to do before, before this COVID-19. Even though how much I tried to fight and make worth of everything I do, it was totally different from what we call the new normal. And to count it maybe, I tend to get down more on uh, the simple things of all the details of everything I see or notice. Then I tried to make uh, work of my time doing some things related to my advocacies and maybe um, connecting to more people. So, so far, that's it. Thanks so much for sharing, Francis. I think it's really cool that you mentioned that things definitely change, especially with routines, but it was something yeah. that you um, took into account and you used for uh, a good instead and something like, yeah. oh, even though not everything is going to be the same, there are some things that I can still keep in my mm. routine. And that you also said you prioritize making new connections, which is very interesting, yes. especially in a digital world now that we're yeah. able to do webinars like this, there's definitely more opportunities for connection. And I'm glad you were able to do that during this time. Exactly, Miss. Thank you. And how about you, Al? What are some things that may or may not have changed both personally, but also as a youth advocate? Um, I guess um, what changed was my body clock. <laughs> um, I started waking up early. Um, I tried doing physical activities um, like cycling and, and all. But as we all know, we were all paralyzed uh, during March, April, and may i guess until now we're still paralyzed so can't really say that i've done something I've, there's something that i have done to change uh, the community because we're not really um uh, there's limited mobilization of uh, manpower so um i really hope by by the start of september or august um we can finally um Mobi I can finally mobilize my team and organize the uh, engineering leadership conference that we're going to organize. Um, it's focused on building sustainable cities. <clears throat> Thank you so much for sharing that, Al. I think what's really important when you what you mentioned is to acknowledge that you know, things are really not that normal as it was before. And if that sort of slows you down a bit, if you need a bit more time to organize or to, you know, uh, take care of yourself, even as a youth advocate, that's okay. And I like that you're saying that 
it's okay. And this is something I'm sure you're also telling the, your fellow members in your organization that you guys are, of course, things are very limited with mobilization, especially on the ground. And if, if you need to take a moment, a breather, that's okay. That's all right. Um, it's not something you have to do all the time. So I really like how healthy that is. Thank you so much, Al. And I think with that question, it's definitely interesting to see how the quarantine has affected uh, us very differently, you know, from different cities, you guys all the way from the Maguete, some are affected more than others even, which is really why it's so important that we support each other, uh, one another, I mean, at the time like this. And I think this is really cool about the Youth for Sustainable Cities community. I always see you guys messaging each other, connecting, and I think that's a really cool way to make sure everybody's all good. And connected to this in that regard, with the different degrees of changing changes that are happening, I mean, what are you both doing to advocate for and to act on creating sustainable cities? Like you mentioned, there are some things, routines have changed, uh, some mobilizations on the ground have been limited. And so what are you guys currently doing? Um, for this one, I wanna start with Al actually, as I know you already mentioned, you're currently organizing an online engineering student conference that is focused on building sustainable cities, just the topic on hand. So tell us a little bit about that, Al. What is the program gonna be about? What, when is it happening and who can join this event? Um, as of now, um, our target audience will be um, engineering students from Silliman University and hopefully uh, <clears throat> students from the Negros Island. Um, the event um, is focused on um, transforming um, future engineering professionals, um, equipping them with the right tools, um, the right mindset to become um, um, community builders, um, sustainable city builders in the future. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we're still in the planning stage. Um, I'm still um, meeting with my team. So it's really hard because we, we all know it's really hard to connect with people, to communicate with people, especially uh, uh, especially that everyone is not um, does not doesn't have um, strong strong connection, internet connection. So it's my challenge, and it's everyone's challenge, and I'm up for the challenge. Yes, I'm up for the challenge, and hopefully by September, we're going to launch it and. We'll inform you guys. Yes. That's super awesome. That's so cool. I think um, that that's very exciting. And is this the first time you guys are doing a digital event, a digital online conference for your organization? Yes, it's the first time. Um, we're adjusting to the new normal. So, yes. Cool. <laughs> So I'm sure you have a team with you who's organizing. What would be one tip that you have for a team of you, uh, young change makers who are trying to do a digital event for the first time? Are there some webinars you guys are trying to do, some tools that you could give us uh, advice on? Um, I think the only advice that I can give is to um, think of a cause that um, they are really passionate about. Um, list down things, list down all of them, and all of the things that they could champion, and gather up some friends and tell them about your plan. So the next step is up to you. Um, it is where you learn to connect with people and discover one part of yourself that you haven't known before. So we can be all, we can all be ambassadors of our different advocacies, and I believe that those who strive to become better will be the ones who will lead this country into building sustainable cities in the future. That's so inspiring, so cool. Thank you for sharing that, Al. And I really <laughs> wish you guys luck in your organization of this first online conference. I think it's gonna be awesome. I hope I can attend, even though I'm not a, a student nor a civil engineer myself. Um, and moving on to you, Francis, how about you? I know you're busy with uh, a lot of things. You were telling me like you were still writing, you were still, you're doing a lot of photography. I see that. Super cool pictures. You guys should follow Francis online. Um, but what are some things that are keeping you very active? What are the things you're working on specifically? Can you tell us a bit about the projects, maybe some articles that you're doing, um, especially on the topic of maybe sustainable cities or your personal advocacies? 
Well, to be honest, Miss Pepper, well, this is my favorite during the quarantine since when I went home from Dumaguete City that we were told to go before everything went on lockdown. Then I was in home quarantine like for almost, let's say, three months or two months and then doing less productive and then just stuck in my room, just sitting, thinking of what I should have to do. Then I said to myself, um, I should not remain stagnant and then I wanted to get involved still in the community and our social issues or discussions about the rising conflicts, what's happening in the Philippines or even in the world. So, so far, I have joined and attended multiple webinars, accepted offers of writing from my friends or from, uh, let's say, national, uh, national affiliations and more press-related works still on the... Uh, local and then national works. And then I had some projects with the local and my international affiliations or the organizations I am into right now. Then definitely it's more on the stories of people in times of crisis brought by COVID-19. And then as of time, I'm currently working on a documentary uh, for a national media. And then I'm still focusing on how sustainable city uh, could help, uh, could be linked onto that documentary. So maybe I'm focusing on supporting our local farmers or the, how they're going to cope up on the crisis of the COVID-19. And then I have this one another org that we're still working on the bridging of communities through journalism, through informing what's really happening during this time, especially in COVID-19. And then we, uh, with the goal, uh, uh, even though we are... Um, experiencing right this at this moment, we still have the hope that we could make actions for maintaining what could be a sustainable city in times of crisis. So far, those were the things I'm doing right now. I love how you ended up with, so far, that's all the things I'm doing. Like, you didn't just list so many things that you were already <laughs> doing. This is what I love about you, Francis. You have so much energy about a lot of things, especially with impact making. I do have a follow up with that. And um, before I ask you a question, we really want to yes, see that documentary. Please do share it with us. We'd love to do yes, a watch Ms. party. Okay. Um, but to, to add to this, I was just wondering, you know, I always see you're so active. Whenever I talk to you, you're so jolly, energetic, always doing a lot of things. Even when we were there in Dumaguete, you were touring me around, doing so many different organizational <laughs> stuff. Um, now that it's the quarantine, and this is a question I just wanted to hmm. ask a little bit of input for you. Do you ever feel, um, you know, that there are days where you're kind of down, where you're kind of like, I don't want to be mm. a change maker today. I kind of want to take a rest. And if mm. so, if you do feel that, like, do you allow yourself? And what are some mm. tips for people who are watching that are youth mm. changers themselves? But sometimes, you know, when you wake up in the morning, you're just kind of like, I don't really feel like doing anything today. Do you get that, Francis? Or you're just too yes, perfect? Yes, I get it. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, actually, it's almost every other day I usually feel that feeling, let's say, like that. And then I just torn between where do I start or how I'm going to end it. Like, it starts as how do I see myself, how I'm going to do those things, or to look at the end that it's about the nation, it's about the community, it's... It's about yourself and the community. Then it's more on how do we see ourselves maintaining and coping up. So, so far, I'm just referring to the starting point, which I understand the needs of myself in order to adjust on how I'm going to connect myself to the community. So basically, so far, my coping mechanisms are just eating, traveling, <laughs> talking, something like that. No it depends worries. upon the me uh, coping mechanisms of individual. Definitely, I totally agree. Um, and I think eating and maybe just talking <laughs> to other people, making sure you're connected to others is very important for sure. Yeah. I think that the main thing and that's you mentioned... the most effective for me. <laughs> And that's the most, that's the one thing I was going to mention is that I think the main thing you mentioned is that you know yourself well, which is yes. very important. If you know yourself and you know your needs, like you said, then you know when mm. to take a break. You know how to regulate yes. your own schedule. Awesome. Oh. Thank you so much for that. Thank advice. you so much, Miss. And just to end this panel, I know we could ask so many things. If you have any questions for Francis or for Al, put them in the chat box in the live stream. We'd be happy to ask 
uh, ask them later on. But just to end on a really positive note from the two of them, you both are so very inspiring to me. So why don't you also inspire our audience for tonight as well? What are some tips on how you can become advocates for sustainable cities as well? I know, Al, you already mentioned some. Maybe you have any other tips on mine, you know, uh, joining your event maybe? How can they become youth uh, change makers just like you guys? If you want, Francis, you can go ahead. Okay. Seems. Um, I actually always put this in mind that we could not achieve a sustainable development without significantly transforming our means of creating our own spaces and for the spaces of everybody in the community. So making cities sustainable means creating opportunities, sustainable and resilient societies and economies. And we have to be inclusive. And there's really more than those thoughts that we are considering right now. It's very, very vast. We have to learn the cycle of life and our living. That is why, uh, I know to say it as Youth for a Sustainable City Ambassador, I value the stories of people in our communities to be heard across, to build and bridge communities that are aware or educated, to help build a progressive community which we always say a sustainable city. Thank you. I could have not said it better than you, Francis, really. Listen to the people, be as inclusive as possible and listen to their yes. stories. Thank you so much for joining us. Al, do Thank you have us. any additional tips for us? I know you already mentioned earlier that it really is important to know your cause and know what you're fighting for. Any additional tips? Um, I really agree with Francis. Um, I think the only tip that I can give is to um, just know how to uh, um, the youth to just know how to manage their time well yes. and to choose um, which is the um, which one to prioritize because we can't really um, to uh, have too much on our plate. Um, if we want to succeed in one thing, we have to focus on that thing, and if we want to um, achieve another, then after finishing the first one, then we'll proceed to the next. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Thank you so much, awesome. Al. That was such practical advice. That goes for everybody watching. You really can't solve everything as much as we all want to, you know. You want to tackle all the different issues? I know you do, but it really is impossible. So, like Al said, know your time management, organize yourself, know what to focus on. And hopefully that helps. Very practical. Thank you so much, Al. Um, and there you have it, folks. In lieu of a round of applause for our two amazing ambassadors, please do flood our live stream with heart reacts so that both Al and Francis can really see um, the love that you guys can give them. Leave them a comment, <laughs> any questions you may have. And again, big, big, big thank you. Big hugs, well, socially distanced hugs to Al and Francis for joining us tonight and sharing with us their time, their experience, their input as Youth for Sustainable Cities ambassadors. Thank you very much, guys. You are very treasured you. members of the thank community. Thank you, Pepper. And thank that's you, it for me. This is Pepper signing out for this panel, just for this panel. Stay tuned, though. Anjali, back to you. Excellent. Thank you so much, everyone. Pepper, for moderating that amazing panel discussion. And of course, to Al Kaiser and Francis, who is joining us all the way from Dumaguete. I am super inspired. Um, I am looking forward. I'm not an engineer, but I'm very excited for that conference. Um, no pressure, but I, I really hope that it actually happens in September. And let us know um, in the Make Sense team so that we can help you um, get more viewers and more participants in this particular um, event. Um, also, I, I like the note that Francis made. I just would like to echo it um, that, you know, we're talking about the basic needs of our fellow countrymen um, whenever we build sustainable and inclusive cities. And of course, basics include um, water access, electricity, food security, access to quality education, etc. But I think you hit the chord there when you said that the stories of the people matter a lot as well. And communication um, is the basic foundation of really getting to know each other's needs and be, being um, know, known um, of all of our needs and being empathic with one another. We get to 
really build an inclusive and sustainable city um, after we ask everyone about it. I am super excited to introduce the moderator for our second panel. Um, we're not done yet. We are far from it, actually. And everyone, thank you for tuning in. If you are new to the um, webinar, please do um, let us know which city are you tuning in from by commenting on the live stream thread. And in lieu of a warm round of applause, please feel free to flood the stream with the hearts and like reacts. Um, as I call on Joko, our very own uh, Make Sense team member, uh, our Make Sense school head, who will be moderating the Cebu panel alongside um, two awesome people in the Y4SC program. Um, Joko, if you could turn on your mic and video, please, so that you can introduce our panelists. All right, thank you so much, Anjali. Um, so thanks for the introduction. Once again, my name is Joko, and I'm going to be joined today by Al and Belle from Cebu. So actually, dagan nagitang mga bisaya sa make sense. Al, Belle, are you here in the call? Um, can you let me know if you're here by turning on your microphones? Hi, sir. Yes, sir. Hi, sir. All right, perfect. So um, I have a confession to make. Uh, to be honest, I've never worked with Al or Bell in the past. Um, I didn't get to join the roadshow in Maguete, Cebu, and Manila. And so I'm pretty curious um, coming into this panel discussion. What made the two of you join our Youth for Sustainable Cities program? So um, maybe we can hear from Bell first and then Al after. Uh, okay, so good evening, everyone. Uh... Why I joined Youth for Sustainable City is that uh, being a child rights advocate for the past few years in our community, I have seen and encountered that a lot of our children are dealing with violence, suffering by uh, different kinds of abuses like physical, mental, emotional abuses, and some of of our children become a victim of online sexual exploitation. Uh, actually, our children also nowadays experiencing exclusion or discrimination. And children worldwide are not being fully protected. So I boy for se is a great way to help me to become more equipped and confident on chasing my dreams that I could help children and create an impact. Uh, lastly, joining the Youth for Sustainable City makes me wonder that uh, maybe this program is a great tool that I could share my passion on being a child rights advocate to everyone. And we can land hand in hand on helping our children to be fully protected because I believe that the best way to protect our children is to prepare them, to educate and empower them so that they can survive, grow, learn, and develop their fullest potential and continue in making our community as sustainable for living. I guess that's all. I guess that's too long answer, sir. <laughs> no worries, no worries. It was perfect. Um, so very inspiring reasons for joining, actually. So basically, you're building sustainable cities through education. You're through education, you're you know bringing down inequalities, bringing down social yeah. injustices. So thank you so much for that. Um, so now I'd like to hear from Al. Um, so Al, why did you join our Youth for Sustainable Cities program? Good evening, magandang gabi, mayong gabi sa tanan. So why I joined Y for SC program because I am advocating for green engineering, and that is so unpopular kind of advocacy. I am a civil engineer, and when you experience a large development, large project, you see bulk of construction materials like steel, gravel, sand, cement, and water, and all these types of resources are all non-renewable. Construction activities also produces mass amounts of carbon footprints, and, and in every development and project, it leaves a large amount of waste. The extraction of steel, gravel, and sand destroys our mountains through mining and quarrying, and the production of cement takes a bigger percentage in responsible, as responsible in emitting greenhouse gases. And, and actually, from the BBC News, 
Last December 2018, entitled Climate Change, the massive CO2 emitter you may not know about, they said that the production of cement is responsible for the 8% global emission of carbon dioxide. Maybe it's just me because no one or few from the construction industry or the engineering industry have ever noticed that if what we are doing is unsustainable or has negative effects to the environment. I know and I believe that development is most essential to the growth of economy, especially if you want to er eradicate poverty. But I dream of a development that from, that from during its construction and during its long time function, it doesn't require the expense or large sacrifice of the environment. That's why I joined the y Y4AC program to widen this unpopular belief of mine. Thank you. All right, thank you as well. Very inspiring. So eco-friendly construction is something that I am definitely looking forward to. Hopefully uh, your advocacy pushes through and you know, becomes mainstream here in the Philippines and across Asia and you know, hopefully across the world as well. Um, so to be honest, I, I just flew back to Cebu right before the lockdown started. But the two of you have been here in Cebu on the ground, um, working with communities, working on your advocacies for much longer. And because of that, what are some of the significant changes you've been seeing here in Cebu when the COVID-19 pandemic hit? Um, so following the same order as the last question, Bell, maybe you can go first. So, actually, we have seen uh, that the COVID-19 hit our country and in our different communities specifically. I would like to point first that uh, we have heard on the different media platforms that it has been reported the, the number of victims of online sexual exploitation of children and the domestic violence against women and children are rising since lockdown based on the report by the Philippine National Police. But uh, on the positive side, our partner agencies, stakeholders, and the community are more vigilant against the perpetrator. And I'm so glad that uh, the, our community are more vigilant in this kind of situation that is happening and everyone is very active in participating like on reporting of the possible abuses that happens in each community. So far, for more information regarding about the situation of the children in, in our community and the different projects and activities that related to the protection of our, of our children, you can visit our Facebook page. Uh, uh, Children's Legal Bureau Incorporated. Yes. All right. Yes, yes sir, Joko. So thank you. Thank you again, Bell. Uh, so it's true, actually, that inequalities and social injustices have been on the rise um, ever since this the pandemic hit the Philippines. But it's good to know that despite everything that's happening around you, you still have the strength and the courage to continue advocating for children's rights through education. Um, so again, uh, thank you so much, Bell. And so now I'd like to hear again from Al, what changes have you been seeing here in Cebu? Yes, Sir Joko, because of the quarantine, I gathered and got young people who believe in my vision and my advocacy. This happened when I asked my friends who are now less busy because of the quarantine that we should create a webinar targeting our local youth as the audience. And also because of my green engineering advocacy, I learned much more about the bamboo that should be integrated as a building materials, as a, also a construction material. And I am most inspired by the TEDx shows and talks about bamboo, a very sustainable material and more environmentally friendly than sustainable hardwood or any mainstream construction materials today. And here in the Philippines, we do have a building code regarding on bamboo, when in fact, it is the most abundant in our country. That's why laser professionals are practicing it using bamboo, and it has a laser demand too. But I know I could do something about it. We could do something about it. The challenge for the bamboo is that it has less established guidelines for construction, less established guidelines as a structural elements or 
less regulations, how it will be used for strength and safety of the stru structure. So that's why no one or lesser, lesser people are building from it. But the quarantine period right, provides me time, um, time in revising, doing designs, uh, in using bamboo as a structural elements in projects and buildings, and also from high rise. And now I'm, I can see I am close to perfecting it, but not quiet. I think that is the great thing the quarantine did to me. All right. So actually very impressive as well, how you leveraged your free time to run webinars to advocate for green engineering and how you've been using your own uh, personal free time as well to continue working on your plans for using bamboo for construction. So um, a little side note, actually Al, uh, he joined one of our design sprint programs to build a, to build a, you know, a green eco-friendly uh, engineering startup. So it's cool to know that you know, this is something that you're still working on. Um, so the two of you have answered my next question a little bit already, but I'd like to dig deeper on the different things that you've been doing to advocate for or act on um, sustainable cities. So again, maybe Bell, you can start by sharing first. Hello, Bell. Na pata. Oh, Are you still there? Maybe Bell lost his air connection, sir. All right, no worries. Um, in the meantime, while we're waiting for Bell to reconnect, um, Al, are you okay with going going first? So, yes, sir. So going back to the webinar we created with my friends, we found, because of that, we founded a com community of young people who are driven for social and environmental change. And currently, I, I am acting as the director of the small local community, and we launched our FB page called Larao Sa Isla. Larao is a Bisaya word, means design or plants, and Isla is a Bisaya for island. So Larao Sa Isla means your plans or vision for the island. So the local community, actually the local community I, I've created is on an island and I'm actually on an island right now because this is my hometown and I am spending my quarantine here. It is located northeast of Cebu. So since then, we initiated so many programs and projects to make our local youth here in our island more aware and engaging even in this quarantine period. So please make sure to visit our official page, La Rosa Isla, for you to see the things we did on instilling our local youth about creating that sustainable world. On the other side, because of my many revisions of my designs on using the bamboo as, as structural elements, uh, right now I have um, I have already made designs for housing using as, using bamboo as a structural element instead of using the mainstream materials using concrete. So as from concrete, I now rely to bamboo. Maybe not quiet. That the design is not quiet, but it's very good already, maybe. I think so. I should believe myself. And I will ask my friends again to help me for the launching, promotion, and advertisement of it because uh, that's it. And to be honest, I am still not too confident with my design, but I, 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 but I know it will turn out okay. And also, I provide an all, online tutorial to some of the same students or senior high school students who are aspiring to become also a civil engineer like me. And with that, I, with that, their quality of learning will not be parted because of the COVID-19. And on that way too, I can instill the younger generation that they should practice on a sustainable engineering application that we aren't taught in schools. Thank you, Sir Joko. All right, wow, super impressive. I, I was really happy hearing all of the stuff that you're, you're doing um, here in Cebu. Um, so actually, you and, sounded pretty and, confident. And also, I am yeah. planning to expand my online tutorial because I only have few students. Maybe I can expand it more and teach more more aspiring civil engineers. I mean, yeah, like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Also, very impressive how you're using your background in engineering to tutor students in your community. Um, so I'm definitely going to like your Facebook page, uh, Lara Seisla. 
and hey. I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing your your bamboo housing designs one of these days. Um, I'm definitely going to be one of those people as well that you know shares your posts and you know um, wow. gets the word out thank that you, you're, <laughs> that, you're you. that you're releasing these designs. Um, but yeah, again, thank you, thank you very much for for sharing. So I think Bell is having a hard time connecting to our Zoom. So I'll, maybe the two of us can move on to our last uh, question for this panel discussion. So uh, you and Bell, you've shared in, through the previous questions, um, you've inspired our audience on how you've been you know, acting towards more sustainable cities. And so for, for my last question, I'd like to ask, what tips do you have um, for advocating for more sustainable cities? So uh, bamboo, uh, as we know, it, it, it's often thought as a poor man's house. When you say bamboo, maybe it's just a house from, for the poor only. And the term payag, which is a Visaya word, and kobo, kobo, which is a Tagalog word, often used only for low-rise and non-elegant housing. And often associated as a weak type of structures and, you know, wouldn't last long. But to all, to all our engineers, architects, we can change that kind of view. We can practice using bamboo even with less or no building codes or guidelines. We can always go back to the basics of our study and apply that instead. So I am encouraging to all engineers and architects. Look at the bamboo structures in Bali. Does it look like a weak structure to you? Even the designers of that Bali structures, bamboo structures in Bali, uh, they confess that uh, their biggest problem, biggest challenge was there are no applicable codes and guidelines of using bamboos for high rise, but still they did amazingly and wonderfully. And to our academy, the, our schools, to our engineering students, architectural students, even to our postgrad students, produce more research regarding it so that, so that we can have our own building codes on bamboo building codes here in the Philippines and make bamboo widely more applicable. And so all, so all, of, so all of our viewers here, maybe it's time for us to make demands of it. If I want housing, I want bamboo. I want a condo, I want it that during its function and during its construction, green engineering methods and applications were, were used. If I want my living space to be water and energy conservative. And I want my living, I want to live knowing that I am living, not harming, but saving Mother Earth. Thank you. I really felt that passion <laughs> while you were sharing. Um, so thank you very much, Al, for, for sharing. Um, uh, uh, actually, this is something, this is a topic that I'm very, very excited for. Um, so I wish you all the best uh, with your, with your eco-friendly startup. So I see here that Bell uh, rejoined our call. Bell, are you are you able to uh, connect? Bell? Hello, Bell. All right. Um, so your internet is still a little bit choppy. Um, so my suggestion along moving forward is, uh, so I have two questions. Yes. Right. Sir. Laban <laughs> Bell. No, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, promise. Okay. Oh okay lang talaga. Yes, sir. Um, Okay, so Hello, sir. maybe what we can do instead is, um, so I have two more questions. The first is, um, what are you currently doing now to continue advocating for Hello, more sir. sustainable cities? Uh, the second question is, um, what tips do you have for our audience to allow them to advocate for more sustainable cities as well? Maybe you can uh, give your answers to those two questions sure. in the comment section of our live stream. Um, I can type the instructions as well in, in our Zoom chat. But yeah, don't, don't worry. No worries about your internet. Um, we're flexible like that. All right. So um, with that said, 
uh, I'll be ending our panel discussion for our Cebu ambassadors. Again, thank you so much, Al, and thank you so much, Bell, uh, for joining our Youth for Sustainable Cities program. And thank you so much for sharing your Welcome advocacies, for giving tips to our audience. Um, thank again, you for again, inviting so also. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you, so now to our audience, if you have any questions for Al or Bell, uh, you know the drill, please share them in our comment section. And before we, we leave this Zoom call, I would love it if you could flood our, our Facebook live stream with likes, heart reacts, care reacts, whatever reacts you can, you can flood it with. Uh, please flood it now in lieu of an applause. So I'll be muting myself now and I'll be handing over the metaphorical mic back to Anjali. Excellent. Thank you so much, Joko, and props to you for moderating this panel. Um, I am sad, Bell. Um, it's okay, but we, we would love to hear um, about your efforts and your experience as a Y4SC ambassador. Um, moving forward in the comment section, so watch out for Bell and, of course, all of our other speakers and panelists. They might be interacting in the Facebook thread right now. So send in your questions and comments there and we might be able to um, give you some time for a Q&A after the three panels, which is um, after the Manila panel that I'm about to introduce right now. Um, let me just echo that um, both quality education and affordable housing are amazing um, advocacies. You know, like it's, it seems very basic, but really it's something that we need to figure out and the truth of the matter is that we really need to be able to provide this to our fellow countrymen so i want to introduce andy um so that she can formally introduce our panelists um from our manila y4 sc ambassadors um andy if you could turn on your mic and videos uh video cam please and introduce yourself and our panelists vince and joe Okay, thank you so much, Anjali, and thank you so much, Cebu, for that amazing panel. Um, we are finally here at the last, but definitely not the last stop of uh, the program at Manila. Um, so good evening, everybody who's watching. My name is Andy. I'm the Communications Director of Make Sense Philippines, and I also co-led the program with Pepper um, a few months back. Um, it's really funny because I just realized I'm wearing the exact same shirt that I wore in, in one of the trainings, so it feels right. Um, but anyway, I am incredibly happy for this opportunity to speak again with the two ambassadors out of the 19 uh, that we met in Manila. Um, the last time that I met with them in, in the same room was February, which feels like a lifetime ago. But anyway, <laughs> we are here and I'm so honored to be able to uh, share with you all of the amazing things that they've been doing since then. What really struck me about the Manila ambassadors that we met was just how diverse uh, everyone was. So um, just imagine we had um, everyone from an engineering student to uh, the CEO of Fashion Social Enterprise to the UN reps to the Vatican, you know, just everyone coming from different uh, sectors in our humble Makati office to be able to discuss ways that we can better um, our cities was really inspiring to me. And it's also the same thing that I feel about the two ambassadors that we have for you today. So uh, without further ado, please, please let me introduce to you uh, the two guests that we have today, Jo and Vin. Jo is currently the new business development manager of the Cultural Center of the Philippines, working on developing and sustaining digital projects that democratize access to Philippine arts. Uh, most recently, she started interning at Make Sense of Social Innovation Program, and her main advocacies are inclusive development, including how culture and the arts can uplift communities and strengthen placemaking. She's also passionate about bridging arts and tech to address and amplify underserved narratives. Uh, aside from this, she is also a volunteer teacher at uh, of Aluma Bakwit School, teaching entrepreneurship to indigenous children displaced from their communities. So Joss, thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. Uh, we also have with us Vince, who is currently taking his master's uh, in urban plan, urban and regional planning at the University of the Philippines School of Urban and Regional Planning. Besides his involvement with Make Sense as a Manila ambassador, of course, for the Y4SE program, he has extensive volunteer work with other organizations. 
most recently being a Alt Mobility PH volunteer researcher for commuter rights, uh, active mobility and sustainable transportation. At the same time, he is also an active member and certified trainer of World Youth Alliance, where he has completed internship programs in the Asia Pacific and Europe offices and represented WYA in conferences held at the UN Nations uh, and the European Parliament. At the heart of his volunteer involvement is his advocacy to promote the importance of human dignity at the core of city planning policies. He is interested in learning about urban economics, urban design, and behavioral economics. Ooh, that was a mouthful. Um, it just goes to show how amazing these two guests that we have for you tonight. Um, and without further ado, let's just get right onto it. So uh, hello, Vince, and hello, Jo. Um, I'm very curious, what made you join the y for sc program? Maybe we could start with Jo. Sure. So uh, thank, uh, hi, everyone. And thank you, Andy, for introducing me. Like Andy said, I am an inclusive development activist, and I've been one for five years now, which essentially means that I advocate for development for all. And my biggest frustration, I guess, with the current state of uh, sustainable urban development is that innovators are leading the movement. And by innovators, I mean the scientists, the techies, the visionaries. I mean, it's not necessarily a bad thing, so don't take me wrong about that. But I believe that to truly create livable cities, we should be looking at our maintainers, our daily wage earners, teachers, artists, and activists whose labor actually sustains society. After all, a big part of building sustainable cities is to actually have citizens who actually want to sustain these cities. Of course, as a cultural worker, my approach to this issue is through the arts because I feel like it's so and it's such an underutilized approach to urban development. I mean, if we look at it at the global scales, most leading urban cities are actually major cultural hubs and art centers. And this is why I joined the y for sc program, because I wanted to mainstream and elevate uh, creative placemaking in the Philippines. Creative placemaking is essentially uh, using arts and cultural based strategies in community development and urban planning. So I also wanted to meet uh, fellow advocates from other disciplines who I could learn from and collaborate with in Manila is so diverse. So I'm glad Y4SC was able to afford me the opportunity to do that. Yes, thank you so much, Jo. I agree with everything you said. I'd love to hear from uh, Vince now. Why did you join the y for sc program? Good question, actually. <laughs> so you know that I am an urban planning student and the typical or conventional way that people um, or students in the UP SERP is that they study for the boards, they get their license, and so they become environmental planners. And the thing about this is that while this is the main motive of what it's like to be an urban planning student, well, I wanted to take it up a notch. I wanted to spice things up. So I found that the Y4SC program by uh, Make Sense is a good alternative platform because unlike, unlike um, <laughs> being a licensed planner, it's more oriented towards working with the government or working in the government, but with Make Sense, you're able to expand it up a bit. You're able to look for more startups who are working to, um, you are working towards social impact and all these various issues involving cities. And so Make Sense has that network and they also have a very great framework towards um, sustainable cities, which is that they, um, they're they oriented towards community development. And at the end of the day, urban planning and community development, they go hand in hand with each other because when we're planning for cities, we're planning for people. So that's all. I love that. Um, what I really loved about what you guys said is you seem to have realized uh, the common need for a more collaborative approach really with how we do sustainable development. Um, you know, one with less gatekeeping and just generally a more inclusive way with even from the way that we start thinking about it. So um, since February, <laughs> the last time we met, has anything changed for you guys <laughs> since then? Maybe you can hear from Jot. 
Yeah, definitely, especially from uh, the arts sector. If I could summarize what uh, change happened during this crisis, it would be the phrase, um, it raised a contradiction that redefined the essential. <laughs> it's pretty loaded, but essentially we can look at it at uh, unpack it at two parts. So at one part, we can see that the arts sector is uh, heavily negatively impacted from the pandemic. We're seeing budget cuts and a, a massive loss of livelihoods because the arts is a very experiential experience. We're uh, a lot of freelancers and employed cultural workers lost their livelihoods. But at the same time, on the other part, we're also seeing people seek the arts at an unprecedented level. I mean, let's look at Italy as an example. When the virus broke out and peaked in Italy, people didn't rush to banks or seek help from the military. They went to their balconies and sang to be with each other. They used art to connect and amplify their voices. And in a world of physical distancing and community quarantine, art is comfort. And art is also strength. It responds where laws fail. So uh, an example of this, I'm going to use an urban development perspective. I think uh, last month, or it was uh, April or May maybe, we saw biking advocates paint the roads with biking symbols. And they like, <laughs> I see Vince <laughs> cheering. And uh, they basically uh, tried to bike the stretch of EDSA just to prove that it's completely possible to bike a, as a main mode of transportation. That's performance art in practice in itself. And people are beginning to see, I guess, that culture and art is really essential and indispensable. And I hope we could really build on that with, with uh, urban development in the future. So that's it for me. Thank you so much, Draw. Um, I totally relate. I feel like the art has really kept me going <laughs> through this crazy time. So thank you so much for touching on that. Um, I'd love to hear from Vince next. Um, with regard to has anything changed since COVID-19, <laughs> so many things have changed actually. A lot of plans got canceled. Well, for one, with the Y4SE program during the roadshow, remember that we had to choose between the relevant issues in Metro Manila and I ended up in housing instead of transportation, <laughs> but I was supposed to work with my co-ambassadors in Manila, and we were supposed to help um, organize workshops and brainstorming sessions with all these organizations who are heavily involved with the urban poor because they suffer from the issue of security of tenure, the, the issue of it. And right now, um, while I'm not working with my co-ambassadors for that. I'm still working toward affordable housing, but this time it's under a different program by Make Sense. So I'll talk more about that later. But outside of Make Sense, um, so many things, especially as a student. So this semester or last semester since the semester ended, last semester was supposed to be when where I was supposed to take my classes, the very, very technical, jargon-heavy classes on planning. So there were a lot of technical skills that I was supposed to pick up um, in UP SERP, but because the classes were canceled, a lot of the opportunities for us to learn um, also got canceled. So if you want to know what technical skills I'm talking about, we're talking about collecting traffic data on the site. We're talking about conducting um, hazard and risk assessment workshops. And I was supposed to conduct a transpo transportation planning workshop with Bataan for my class. And I was supposed to conduct a hazard and risk assessment workshop with Tai Tai. And <laughs> we can't obviously do that because mass gatherings are not allowed. <laughs> we, we know the risk involved with the COVID-19 pandemic. So as a person who's just starting out as a uh, in this field, in this planning field. It feels like I went back to square one because I just started studying last semester and I'm pretty new to a lot of the very, very technical aspects of it. So those were the things that, <laughs> that the COVID-19 pandemic has caused, <laughs> especially when it comes to continuous learning. It was such a disruption, albeit not sustainable one. <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy, you know, especially for students. Um, thank you so much, Vince and Joe. 
what I really love about what you guys uh, have been doing, continue to do is really, you know, despite the pandemic, you have intensified actually what you guys uh, have been doing. And I feel that for a lot of people who are tuning in right now, you know, they share your advocacies, um, but either they feel a sense of, you know, volunteer fatigue or maybe learned helplessness with everything that's going on. I'm sure that they would love to hear, you know, like, paano ba talaga, like, concrete ways that you guys have been doing so far to advocate for a sustainable city so far. So I would love if you guys can touch a little bit on the many things that you guys have been doing. Um, so we can start with Joe again. <laughs> of course. Thank you, Addy. So um, actually, recently, I've been doing a couple of things outside of work. So uh, the first one is that I'm still volunteering for Alumud Bakwit School. It's a makeshift school for uh, indigenous children from Mindanao who are displaced from their communities. And actually, we have a call for volunteers. Is it okay if you share that, Andy, or is that going to be later, Pa? Uh, we can share it now as well. Okay, great. There so um, if you're um, if you're a writer, a graphic designer, or a researcher, and you're interested, or you're already an existing uh, indigenous rights uh, advocate, please join us. You need a lot of help. So just sign up at the link that's flashed on the screen right now. Thank you very much, Andy. So I actually have another project that I'm working on, which I'm hoping to launch by December. And it's driven by my personal um, insight that data rarely moves people, but great art always does. So I'm looking into collaborating with a group of artists, activists, and community developers to produce an alternate to a policy paper. So it's a digital scene called These Cities Aren't Made For Us. And the project will highlight narratives of displaced and vulnerable communities and their vision of their dream cities. Uh, the target first feature is going to be isolated or stranded OFWs who are returning to the Philippines and the provinces. So I hope you support it when I do put it up. <laughs> well, for sure, please uh, keep us posted when it uh, is finally released. I can't wait. Uh, it sounds like an amazing zine. I'd love to read it. Thank you so much, Jo. Um, Next, we have Vince. Please, I would love to share your tips. Oh, so what am I doing now to advocate for sustainable cities? Well, as a UP student, <laughs> I'm still studying and reviewing, doing self-study with the lessons or classes that I was supposed to finish this semester. So I'm learning more about the planning process, all the details on the different steps, so that in the future, I'm able to more effectively uh, assist local governments when they're creating their various plans. Because I'm planning to become a licensed environmental planner in the near future so that <laughs> I can be able to help them with whatever plans they have, especially now within the context of the pandemic. There are a lot of changes that have to be made with regard to the different plans. But outside of being a UP student, I'm actually tackling two very, very different issues. So I'll talk about the housing aspect first. So as I've said before, I'm more involved with Make Sense in their reaction program. I am a super mobilizer. So I am leading a group of volunteers with the, the, the housing theme. And I'm coordinating with City Hub Dormitory. And City Hub Dormitory, it's a social enterprise. And it tackles affordable housing for minimum wage workers and people who need to live closer to where they work. So they provide housing for as low as 1,900 a month using recycled container vans. So not only does it address um, the issue of long commutes, not only does it address the issue of housing, it also addresses sustainability in terms of what can be done in providing places where people could live closer to where they work. So volunteers have to complete a set of weekly tasks and they're going to do this for an entire month. We started last week and we're going to be opening slots in the coming week. So please stay tuned for that. Um, we host kickoff calls where we meet all the various volunteers to introduce the context of why Make Sense is reaching out to all these uh, volunteers 
and that's because we perceive the COVID-19 crisis as a humanitarian crisis. And then <laughs> besides make sense, um, I am helping lead my team in research for out mobility. So we are researching about active transportation, all the best practices and policies that other countries have taken in addressing um, the limited mobility brought about by the pandemic. So for example, my team and I are looking into different scientific journals and academic studies on how bike lanes and um, how bike lanes and different infrastructures can be established so that more people can pursue better and more sustainable mobility options. That's pretty much it, actually. That's pretty much it. <laughs> Guys, <laughs> everything we're doing is crazy. And it's so inspiring to me. I'm sure uh, people who are watching have uh, picked out at least one thing that they can do uh, in this quarantine. I love what you guys are doing so far. Again, if I can echo what you guys, uh, what Vince and Josh said, please do <laughs> join reaction. We uh, accept volunteers on a rolling basis. And of course, when uh, Vince finally gets his license, please do tap him for all your needs <laughs> in the future. Um, all right, unfortunately, uh, I would love to have you here for the rest of the hour and just pick your brains. Um, but I am down to my last question, unfortunately. Um, I guess we could end by sharing maybe any last words of advice or tips you have for viewers. Uh, maybe uh, you could share them now. We can start with Jo again. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. So I have a few because I'm with the Beda. <laughs> so the first one is obviously to please support our local artists. The best way to support our artists is to pay for their work. Exposure is not payment for artists' work. And uh, I'm just going to plug it right now that in CCP, we have CCP online and we still have Virgin Lab Festival, which is a series of plays only for 100 pesos. Okay, that's enough for the plug. So <laughs> moving on to the tips. Uh, the next one is to meet people outside of your comfort zone. I think uh, that's really one of the best ways to grow, not only as an advocate, but as a person. It challenges your bias biases and it uh, adds new insights and learnings and uh, I think the biggest advice I can get is to get organized. One of the main reasons we get advocate fatigue, that's how I'd like to call it, is because we feel overwhelmed or feel like we're alone but it's important to be surrounded by people who are also struggling with you and it's also important to remember that small acts make a difference but only when you're doing it with other people. And if all else fails, just ask yourself, lagit lagi para kanino. Or in English, for who am I doing this for? Always ask yourself that whenever you get tired. So I'm just gonna uh, I'm gonna take a page from Vince's Vince's urban development book. <laughs> it's from my favorite radical urbanist David Harvey, who said that only when it is understood that those who build and sustain urban lives have a primary claim to that which they have produced and that one of their claims is to the inalienable right to make a city more after their own heart's desire will we arrive at the politics of the urban that will make sense. Thank you. Make sense. Fact. Make Fact. sense. <laughs> oh, man. Taga talaga. Thank you so much, Jo. Thank you talaga. Um, finally, Vince, any closing statements? I think I would like to just end it by focusing on the aspect of advocacy. So what's important really when you're advocating for something is you learn more about your advocacy. You deepen your relationship with your advocacy because that's when you realize that there are a lot of um, intersections with other disciplines. You realize that your advocacy is more cross-cutting and that's where you start to understand that it's something that is really, really important when we're advocating for or we're, when we're looking to envision a sustainable city. So when we're talking about advocacy, um, the thing is your feed sometimes provides you with too much information and it becomes so draining. There's so much visual noise and it's pretty tiring to react to everything. But when you focus on one advocacy, you just mainly focus on how your cause is connected with everything else because everything is connected with everything else. It 
feels empowering because you have more agency and creative fidelity in trying to make sense of your cause with the very issue that uns that um that is very un that unsettles you the the very issue that unsettles you about the current um the, the now so if you haven't found your advocacy it's okay uh take your time because Advocacy is a lot of nitty gritty work. It's a lot of research. You have to learn and better understand and educate yourself on all the different jargons, the stakeholders, the concepts, the systems. There is so much to learn. But what happens is that it becomes more rewarding because you realize that advocacy is something that is very important when we're trying to push for um, better cities because at the end of the day, you don't need to be an urban planner to discuss our need for better cities. You don't need to be an urban planner to advocate for better cities. You simply just need to experience the city in itself. You need to feel, see, hear, smell. <laughs> and more, more importantly, you need to um, feel what it's like to be in the city so that it will inspire you to learn more about city living and hopefully in the future, you will be able to take action on changing and making social impacts that will eventually make your city better. Well, there you have it, everybody. <laughs> if I may echo what uh, the two amazing people said, uh, if you don't have an advocacy, it's okay. Allow yourself to experience your city. And again, what also what Jaw said, um, when all else fails, ask yourself, lagit lagi para kanino. Thank you, Jo and Vince. I enjoyed and I missed seeing you dearly. Um, now I'm giving the mic back to Anjali. Thank you both. Amazing, very inspiring panel. Um, thank you guys. Thank you, Andy, for moderating the panel with Vince and um, Jo. Um, grabe yung lagi para kanino. Um, I cannot quote it perfectly. My Tagalog is escaping me right now. I have to practice even more, but I would like to echo some more of um, the things that you guys mentioned early on actually in the panel, wherein because of the pandemic, we actually redefined the essential um, according to Joe. And I, I have to echo this because it's true, like when we think about education and quality education, um, usually the mind floats to math and sciences, et cetera. But if you look at and um, look back at what are the free services and some people may call it entertainment that became free what, right when the COVID pandemic hit. It was the arts, really. Google um, advocating for its museum tours online and virtually, um, Netflix, um, Audible, and other um, books um, platform actually gave their services for free just so we can all enjoy um, the arts and literature uh, that we usually take for granted. Um, I would also like to echo what Ben said about how some opportunities um, to learn got cancelled because of the COVID pandemic. But um, the good news is that there are new opportunities to learn, um, including what they advocated for, which is some events and shows happening with CCP right now, and even volunteer work, like the reaction work um, that we are actually um, doing right now in Make Sense in partnership with City Foundation. Let's not forget to give the proper credit also to our partner, City Foundation, who without them, we cannot do many of these things. So thank you so much and kudos to everyone. Um, I would love to hear more about the Y4SE Ambassador's journey ever since the program started. Um, but for now, I'm afraid we have to move forward. Actually, we have two more parts to this webinar. And for those who are viewing right now, we are approaching the interviews to, um, for us to get to know the two startups uh, that are part of the academy um, under the Y4SE theme, among many others. We will begin with getting to know Kathy Amores, the founder of Tabang. So Kathy, if you could turn on your mic and video, please. Um, and I will ask you the first question so that we can get to know you better. Hi, Kathy. How are you doing? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, doing great. Kathy is actually tuning in from Cebu, guys. Um, so, hello, hello. Hi. Um, Kathy, um, you were part of the Y4SC Sprint and you graduated and became part of the 
Academy um, of Make Sense Incubation Program right now. Um, perhaps you could tell us a bit about yourself um, and how you found Y4SC Sprint um, when you started it. Um, so, hi, I'm Kathy. I'm a materials engineering graduate from UP, and currently I'm working in data analytics. And yeah, I was part of the Youth for Sust Sustainable City Sprint, and it was great. And from there, we, from there, I... So yeah, so I'm from Cebu, so from the Queen City of the South, and we are a group of three women, like the Charlie's Angels, with different skill sets. So we have Karen from a computer science background who is working on the prototyping. We have Stai, who's from linguistics, who's working on branding on communications and me who works all around so yeah excellent um as a founder of a startup i'm sure that you are not um any stranger to doing all around things for your company um thank you so much kathy for introducing us to who you are and a bit about your team um perhaps now you can um what the problem um what is the problem that you identified um, a particular gap, and uh, why are you trying to solve it? I mean, what are you, why are you motivated to work on this particular problem? Right, so, you know, most fires happen in residential areas, and growing up in Cebu, I live in a very fire-prone neighborhood. So while growing up, you know, our house was almost burned three times, and two of those happened at around 2 to 3 a.m. while my parents were asleep. So just imagine sitting in the living room a few hours after midnight, and you smell something, something smoky, and you look out of the window, and you see this blazing fire a few meters from you. So I remembered feeling numb and shouting at my father and my mother who were asleep. So my father immediately rushed to the source of the fire. My sisters and my mother were trying to gather all our things, you know, just some papers and clothes. And yeah, the fire truck did arrive. Yeah, the fireman arrived like with a bit of difficulty because the, node, the roads at the time were, were narrow and it all happened late in the night. So imagine that if those fires are not put out early, it grows and it continues to devour properties and even lives. So what if we can be alerted when a fire occurs and at the same time, the barangays and the nearest fire stations are also alerted? Um, will people be mobilized faster? Well, or will people be less panic? Or can we save more lives and properties if we know it's happening earlier? So um, we believe that with the current technology that we have, we can build preventive measures for large-scale fire disasters. And this is where Tabang was born. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kathy. And thank you for sharing even your personal experience with disasters like this. Um, as everyone may already know, Y4SC, one of the Y4SC teams is really preparedness for um, emergency and disaster response. And that is why the project of Kathy in the form of Tabang as, the start, as a startup is really interesting. So Kathy, if I want to, I just want to push this a bit further so that our audience can gain even more appreciation in what you're doing. Um, can you tell us more about the project that is Tabang? Yeah, so, so Tabang aims to build fire resilient communities by providing an affordable detection unit that allows rapid response to fire disasters. So Tabang has two unique selling points. These are automation and affordability. So Tabang automates sending alert notifications to the household, the barangay related to the household, and the nearest fire station. So unlike 
those expensive automated fire systems set up in the buildings, we plan to make each Tabang unit as affordable and accessible to the general public. Excellent. Actually, when I was trying to learn more about um, Tabang and your, your advocacy, Kathy, I had to check about the, my own fire alarm system and I have no idea about how it is. And I remember in one of our conversations, you told me that not a lot of people actually know when, when or how to contact the fire stations in their own localities. And having a product like what Tabang is trying to create um, which automates the alert for the people who will respond to the fire emergency. That would be really, really helpful and relevant, especially for people. I could just imagine myself that I would be really, really panicked and confused about what's happening. So thank you so much, Kathy, for telling us a bit more about Tabang. Now, um, this might be an obvious, the answer to this might be an obvious one already, but I'd still like to ask, no, um, what will the country, what will the Philippines look like if more people patronize Tabang and its products? So, yeah. So if Tabang is patronized by the people and the country, we see a country that is more prepared against fire disasters, a community that are aware and vigilant and a community that continues to work together to build a fire resilient Philippines. Of fire disasters. All right. Thank you so much, Kathy. I would love to hear more about Tabang for sure. And for those who are watching right now, if you have any questions for Kathy, her team about the product about the company and its advocacy, um, please do let us know in the comments section. You can also follow their page um, on Facebook, Fresh Off the Press, um, which is yeah. um, at Tabang Help Tech, um, as you can see here on the screen. So thank you so much, Kathy. Do you have any final words um, for our viewers? How else can they support you and your growing startup? Yeah, so, so we have our the early stages so we're currently in the prototyping phase and we're trying to build our community and yeah we'd love for everyone to be part of our growing community so yeah just like what Anjali said you can like follow and share our page Tabang Help Tech and yeah you will be posting their product updates and surveys tips fun facts campaigns and games in the following weeks and we'd love to get everyone interested on board so you can send us you can also send us an email at tabangseb at gmail.com if you have any questions or simply message us on the page yeah we'll respond as quick as we can so thanks guys Excellent. Thank you so much, Kathy. Let us give Kathy, um, instead of a warm round of applause, obviously, let's flood the stream with hearts and likes. And of course, we would definitely appreciate your support for Tabang um, by following their page and inquiring on how you can be part of their community and advocacy. Thank you so much, Kathy. Thank you. All right, cool. Now we are moving on to our second set of entrepreneurs. Um, you are going to have a great time getting to know them. Actually, I've met um, Jill and Paul just a few weeks back. Uh, they were a late entry to the academy, relatively, um, because we already technically started with one boot camp before they got started. But I am super happy to have them on board. And now to talk about Slick Sick, um, we have Jill and Paul. Um, can you turn on your video and mic, please, so that you can tell us a bit about yourself and maybe also about the team. Um, we can start with Paul. Hi, everyone. So my name is Paul. Um, I graduated from a legal management background in DLSU. And currently, I am handling the business development department for Selexic. And here I have Jill with me. All right, so thank you, Anjali, for having us tonight. Um, 
I'm Jill. I'm currently a part-time faculty member in UP Diliman teaching materials engineering as well as a course called Humanitarian Engineering Entrepreneurship and Design. Um, I'm also part of Salik 6 research development team. And um, our team was formed just last April during Startup Weekend Philippines. And uh, we've never met in person before, <laughs> except for Angelo and I. <laughs> but uh, I'll introduce each one briefly, one by one. So let's start with Mai. Mai is our marketing lead. So she's currently a student in the Ateneo de Manila University, taking up BS Information Technology uh, Entrepreneurship. Um, next is Carlo. Carlo has experience in the cybersecurity industry. He is a licensed um, electrical engineer and is currently taking his master's in the same field from UP Diliman. Anthony is also part of the product dev team. He's a graduate of computer science from the University of Cordilleras, and he has experience as a project developer for a tech business incubator. Vincent, on the other hand, is uh, part of the research dev team. Uh, he's a medical doctor, a graduate of UP Manila, and was a co-convenor for the country's guidelines for health research prioritization. And of course, last but definitely not the least, we have Angelo. He's our lawyer. He graduated from UP Law, and he actually just signed his scroll today, I think, in the Supreme Court. So um, he specializes in intellectual property. So yeah, that's, that's our team. Thank you, Ma'am Jill. I mean, um, <laughs> yeah, Jill, <laughs> for sharing the team. Um, I would like to ask now, in the same light, um, well, talk about like a young startup team, right? You all just met literally um, the early part of this year. So maybe if you could tell us a bit about um, what was the problem that you identified and what inspired you and it's currently motivating you to work on Silic Six. Sure. So um, the team identified three major gaps. So first through observation, and then we validated it through a series of uh, validation interviews with our stakeholders. So the first one is the tedious application and monitoring processes involved, uh, especially in big funding agencies, big research funding agencies. So I think each person we talked to, they all acknowledge the fact that there is bureaucracy involved, especially in these big agencies. And in Saliksik, we want researchers to focus really on their research work, not on the seemingly endless paperwork they need to accomplish just to get their resources. So that's gap one. The second is the gap between researchers and the public. And this was made apparent last year during the Department of Agriculture's budget hearing, wherein they were questioned why they had this big budget allocation for research. Bakit daw ba sila baliw na baliw sa research? Ah, and hindi ba nila yung research? So that was sort of a wake-up call that people don't seem to appreciate the, the value of research in our everyday lives. Um, in general, people have this thinking that research is only relevant to geeks, to nerds, to academics, when in fact, that's not the case. So uh, the third and last one is that uh, research, the research playing field in the country is not level. And this is uh, most especially true for the regional and far-flung areas wherein they are at a geographic disadvantage to access to resources. So these resources can be either in terms of funding, in terms of mentoring, in terms of supplies to carry out the research projects. So yeah, these are the gaps that Salixic uh, is trying to fill out. I, I resonate with that a lot because um, until now, whenever I tell people that I, I, I love research or I love statistics and stuff like this, they would give me like a weird look and be like, why? Why research? So <laughs> you have an uphill battle, it seems like, about um, <laughs> educating and giving people the venue to appreciate research more and more. 
Um, maybe very quickly, Jill or Paul, if you could tell me, um, what do you think is the main reason or factor why um, most people or a lot of people do not appreciate research as much? Okay. Um, so I think we think it boils down as well to communication. Um, so there's this book by um, Yuval Noah Harari, The 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. And the first sentence in the first chapter says that humans think in terms of stories instead of facts, numbers, and equations. And if we look at the usual output of research projects, especially in our field in engineering, what do you see? Facts, research, and numbers, even though we know that um, stories resonate more with humans. That's why I think people only see the output. So for instance, the cell phone, we see the cell phone, but people don't really know the story before it became the cell phone, which is mostly the research part, materials research, product development research, market research. There's a lot of layers of research there. So yeah, we think it's communication. Um, okay, thank you so much, Jill. I definitely agree. Sorry, just one more follow-up question before I let go of this topic altogether. Um, I know that, well, at least part of your website says that um, some of the projects or even a lot of the projects that you want to support um, is in light of the COVID situation. And I am just curious about what, how or why do you think research is key to fight COVID-19? Okay, um, so, well... In the Philippines, we have different researchers who are doing bar, uh, various research to, to either help alleviate the shortage in PPEs or to help in, um, you know, people develop these sanitants and all that. And that also involves research. And in our platform, we have one onboarded research specifically on COVID-19. And they, their aim is to produce locally manufactured um, face masks because all the N95 level face masks are, or most of it, are imported by the country. So they want to source the materials locally. They want to manufacture it locally. And yeah, that's just some, uh, some ways by which research can help. Aside from the obvious, of course, that the vaccine is developed by research, right? <laughs> so. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Jill. Um, it's very concise how you said it, but I agree. I mean, even in the first, um, first few um, lines that you said earlier on in one of the previous questions is that people usually don't appreciate the work that goes into the products, the end products that we enjoy right now. May it be phones or um, hopefully sooner um, rather than way, way later, um, the vaccines and maybe cure for the COVID-19 um, disease. So thank you so much. Jill, um, I have to move on. If anyone else has any questions um, for Siliksik and even for Tabang earlier, I know that the people are still commenting. Please um, do so on the thread. We will give some time um, for it after the event, I'm sure. Um, but Paul, Jill, uh, maybe you can tell us now a bit more about Siliksik as a startup. All right. Okay. So um, Jill really tackled the problem that that we are, we are solving. So what Selixic is, is that we are the country's first crowdsourcing platform that's dedicated to providing funding and network op networking opportunities specifically dedicated for Filipino research. And um, how we provide funding opportunities is that we allow researchers to run crowdfunding campaigns on our platform, which you can take a look um, on, at our website. And also we, we're looking to partner with institutions that's actually um, willing to provide or establish a fund with us that has certain criteria which researchers can possibly apply for. And when it comes to networking, um, we are also looking to partner with government agencies that would be um, willing to create research challenges with us that can possibly be tackled by researcher, researchers that would be interested in solving the problem. And also, some of the things that we're looking at as we progress is being able to provide um, mentoring opportunities. Because as, as Jill mentioned, um, when it comes to research, I, I really think the, the, the gap is, is where, is cause of the communication. A lot of researchers are really um, heads on when it comes to the technicalities of the research. 
that sometimes it can be difficult when it comes to conveying the value to other people and that some of the things that we want to accomplish through the, the mentorship that we want to create through the platform is addressing those pro problems like those. Excellent. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, very well said. Um, and finally, of course, I, I can't leave uh, the interview with you guys without asking, what would the Philippines look like if more people patronized Saliksik um, as a startup? So through the support of people, we, we really want to create a strong research culture in the Philippines. And because of because of the strong research culture, we can see this triggering three things. We, we want to see create higher research productivity that's um, achieved through the opportunities that we provide through the platform. And also we want to create a level playing field for researchers across all disciplines and regions. Because um, Jill mentioned that um, researchers or researchers are at a disadvantage already just because they're not situated near the resources, which is around here in the NCR region. And we want to be able to provide opportunities because we really do believe that there are a lot of research talents out there that just really need access um, to resources for, for them to make their research happen. And lastly, we want to be able to facilitate um, interactions and collaborations between researchers around the Philippines because we do see that there's, there are existing silos when it comes to research. We see that a lot of universities are focused on um, the research that's being done inside of the university. So through the research challenges that we, we provide, we want to be able to facilitate um, collaborations with researchers that have um, the, the capabilities and the talents to tackle the problem, but being able to collaborate with researchers that's not just in their universities, but as well as um, researchers that's located and outside of the region, be able to work with them just to tackle the problems that can potentially solve or benefit the country. And through those, um, this is why we believe that achieving these um, three things would be very important to us because we believe that research is at the heart of every nation's progress. Excellent. Much love for research and researchers out there. Thank you so much. Paul, Jill, um, very quickly, please let the audience know on how they can support you and Felixic even further. Great. So um, if we would really appreciate it if um, you can like our FB page. It's Salixic Philippines. You can quickly search that on Facebook. And also, we're going to be building our community soon. So if you're a researcher yourself, if you're a research advocate, or if you're an organization looking to collaborate with researchers, or if you're just interested to know more about the research environment in the Philippines, we would really appreciate if you can sign up and join our community, which you can easily find in our Facebook page. It's one of our more recent posts, so you'll be able to see that easily. Perfect. Yay for community. Thank you so much, yeah. Jill and Paul of Saliksik. Um, everyone, you. please Thank give you. them... Thank you. Please give them like a flood of hearts you, and likes in lieu of a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, now... We are approaching um, the last part of this webinar. And of course, it's not the least part. In fact, I could argue that it's one of the most exciting parts because it's the closing talk of Keisha Mayuga of Life Cycles PH. Um, she will be sharing some notes to us on how we can wrap everything up um, that we just heard um, and also including her own experience in Life Cycles PH. So without further ado, I would like to ask um, Keisha to turn on her video and mic, please. Hello. Hello. Yes. Pa, pa. <laughs> yes, Gary, of course. I love hearing how engaged everyone is. And I'm so happy that you've provided this platform really to talk about this. So thank you. Of course, much love, much love to City Foundation, our partner, and of course, the rest of the Make Sense team who made all of this happen. Thank you so much. Shout out to everyone. So, Keisha, um, if you could, um, can you please introduce yourself and then I will sh share your slides as well. And let sure, me know. sure. Um, um, hi, everyone. Um, so, while we're doing the technicals, um, I'm Keisha Mayuka. Um, I am an environmental planner, uh, but I would call myself really a, a transport planner because that's my uh, focus. 
Um, I'm a transport consultant now for the Asian Development Bank. And I'm also the founder of Life Cycles PH. I'll talk about a little bit about that later. Um, I'm also part of the Move as One Coalition, which really pushes for better transportation, especially in light of this pandemic. And yes, I bike almost everywhere. And yeah, I actually, fun fact, I actually don't know um, how much a jeepney ride costs because that's how long I haven't been on one because I bike everywhere. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so that's it. Um, yeah, so I think Ash has my slides there. Yes. Okay, so um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, my advocacy, which is really cycling. So I'll talk about cycling towards sustainable cities. Solutions not just for now, but for the future. Uh, next slide. In the beginning, there was traffic. Most of us are familiar with this scene. The photo on the right is EDSA, one of the busiest and most controversial roads in the Philippines. It's hard to disassociate EDSA with traffic, and the data shows. According to TomTom Tom Research in 2019, Manila was ranked number two as the most congested area to drive in. We've wasted 257 hours, or almost 11 days, in a year just stuck in rush hour traffic which we literally could have used as vacation leaves elsewhere. In college, I figured I didn't want to be part of that traffic, so I started biking, and not for sport, for actually getting to places. It was liberating, but I stopped when I graduated and started working my first job. A few weeks into my work, a colleague of mine, a new mom who just got back to work again, confided in me that she was not used to not seeing her son when she started working. It was because she wasted so much time in traffic, so she would have to leave so early that she didn't see him wake up and get home so late that she only reached him while he was sleeping already. I thought that was ridiculous and so inhumane. She was just one of the millions of Filipinos who don't get to see their families because they waste five to six hours a day trapped within our poor transportation conditions. So I decided to shift my gears from my journalism background into making transport better for the Philippines. Next slide, please. I made a goal after my epiphany. I want people to get home in 30 minutes or less, faster than your average pizza delivery. <laughs> for that to happen, we needed to change the city. My personal vision was that I wanted to live in a city where my future kids could bike to the park after school and I wouldn't have to worry, unlike probably most parents today, and it's totally understandable. In 2017, I made a vow to work towards that vision. Like Vince earlier, I took up my master's in urban and regional planning, got my environmental planning license, and worked in development and transportation. And most importantly, I started bike commuting again. But then, dun dun dun, next slide. <laughs> COVID-19 happened. Everything changed when the virus attacked. This was not part of my plan, nor anyone's plan for that matter. I didn't know how to continue with my goals because everyone's priority was to survive. Cities needed to adapt, and we did too. Next slide, please. There were some good adjustments, like the popularization of the mobile palenque. I personally love this because um, I get vegetables like every week nearby my building. And some other adjustments for a lot of us was working from home. So if you can see there, it's a photo of my brother um, having a meeting with my dogs. Um, but some adjustments were a little bit more difficult, such as restricted access for many citizens to go out or in some areas. The change that hit home the hardest for me as a transport planner was the loss of public transport. Next slide, please. I remember when the government announced that all mass transport will be stopped the next day. I wept. I cried because it hurt me to know that so many people will be stranded, left to walk, and unable to even get home. Many people, just hours after that announcement, were left to wait overnight in checkpoints for nothing because there were no jeeps or buses. Some had to walk for five to six hours just to see their families. When the government was asked, how were the frontliners supposed to get to work? They answered, take a car or walk. Sadly, 
only 20% of Metro Manila owned a car. So imagine 80% had to walk. That was crazy to me. We had to do something about this. There must be other options. Next slide. And what other options do we have aside from walking? As a bike commuter, I thought this was really the best time to start talking about active transport. In less than 20 hours, since the announcement that there will be no public transport, a bunch of friends, transport advocates, restless young people and I got together and put up a donation drive to provide bikes for frontliners who had no means to get around. Next slide, please. And so Life Cycles PH was born. Ironically, on the same day I was born. So it was born on my birthday. <laughs> um, our goal was clear. We wanted to provide bikes to essential workers so they could have a way to get to work and home. We did this in two ways. First, we collected donations from individuals, companies, and groups who wanted to help out and bought bicycles in bulk to donate them to hospitals, LGU, supermarkets, and malls. Through these donations, we were able to collect more than 3 million pesos and, and donate to more than 1,000 frontliners in more than 50 institutions. People are still donating up to now, and thanks to some of our reaction volunteers, shout out, and people, people have still been giving and we have still been providing bikes because more people actually need bikes. The second way we got bikes to frontliners was through the Life Cycles PH community Facebook group. The community allowed people who wanted to lend bikes to match with people who needed to borrow bikes during the, sec the enhanced community quarantine. There was no money involved for the most part and the only currency was purely trust. These are just strangers lending their bikes to other strangers. We really saw the Bayanian spirit within the community with some veteran cyclists even helping out with tips on bike commuting. Now it's a community of newbie bikers encouraging each other and posting about their bike commuting experience. From this group, we've had 400 lender borrower matches since the beginning of the quarantine. This movement also inspired other cities like Baguio, Davao, Cagayan de Oro to do the same in their communities. Next slide, please. Through Life Cycles PH, we've helped more than 1,400 frontliners get to work, not just for a day, but every day since they got a bike. Here are just a few of them. Ryan on the left is an on-call nurse because someone lent him a bike from the community. He was able to bike to a father who was looking for someone to visit his home and inject medicine to his baby because they couldn't go to the hospital. It was too risky for his baby. Here in the middle is Willie. He works for Pasig City and saw that people that biking is something he will choose to do every day, even if public transport resumed. His hour and a half GP commute is now a 40 minute bike ride home. And lastly, the one on the right is April with her colleague. She works in the medical city and bikes home to Antipolo, which is really hard. I mean, if anyone's been to Antipolo, it's going up. <laughs> so she only started during the ECQ. She only started biking during the ECQ and has since then been rallying and promoting cycling in her own hospital. She requested for the um, bike wraps and now so many people in the hospital are biking. There are hundreds more stories I could tell you about the lives that have been changed by a simple bike, but we might take all night and I might get mad at me. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, next slide. <laughs> but now we know that there are many cyclists on the road. How do we make it safer for them? A lot of the cyclists you see now in Metro Manila are new bikers, and it can be scary, understandably. So we started rallying for protected bike lanes in the city. The photo on the left is another movement I was part of, the EDSA Evolution, and we launched bike lanes on EDSA last May 24. That's me biking in the white shirt. <laughs> we planned to put this up with only less than a week of planning, and we were so excited to launch it in the infamously trafficked road, if you saw the picture earlier. This is like, is it the same road? <laughs> Unfortunately, we only ran the bike lanes for a few hours, but this was just the beginning of a domino effect of pop-up bike lanes around the Philippines. Within a month, cities started putting up their own pop-up bike lanes. San Juan City, the photo on the right, launched their bike lanes on June 3, World Bike Day. Other cities like Baguio, um, Davao, Iloilo, Mandaluyong, Taguig, and Quezon City have also been growing their own bike 
infrastructure programs, planning not just for this pandemic, but even beyond. Next slide, please. My experience in pushing for better cities for cycling would not have been possible if I did it by myself. Everyone has a part to play, whether you are part of civil society, the government, the private sector, or you. So everyone has their own ground to cover. Um, if you can see the different examples here, um, the one in the upper left is Bikers United Marshalls. So they put up pop-up bike lanes during rush hour along Commonwealth. On the next photo, um, Itaka, which is another movement giving reflectors so that cyclists are seen. Um, and in turn, you know, the government is also helping out. Um, car drivers are warned not to use or park on bike lanes. And if you can see the next photo on the bottom, it's um, DOTR's design on EDSA to put up protected bike lanes um, on the outer lane. And the private sector also has its part to play. Uh, if you can see, there's a lot of bicycle parking and it's getting fuller and fuller. So every time I actually visit a, an establishment or a mall, they keep adding bike racks because that's just how many people are biking today. So next slide, please. So what are some things that we can learn from this pandemic, this experience in the pandemic? Next slide. Um, I learned that cooperation is really important. People are always arguing which approach is better, top down or starting from the administration side versus the bottom up or more grassroots or community driven. Top down has its benefits for longer term effects, but may take a long time. Bottom up is a fast approach, but may be temporary or unsustainable. But the best way really is to work together, top down and bottom up to make something fast well-planned and sustainable. So it's not a matter of which is better. We, we all have our parts to play and the best way really to get things done and to make it sustainable is to work together. Um, next slide. We can do so much with the technology we have now. Honestly, without the tools we have in social media, I wouldn't be here talking in this webinar. Being connected online allowed me to meet different people, learn from them, and let my voice be heard. I've only been in the field of transport for three years, but because of being vocal about biking and engaging with different groups online, I sort of made a name for myself that allowed me to start life cycles and put up pop-up bike lanes. If you're listening or watching this, you have the same tools too. It's just a matter of being creative with how we use the technology in front of us. And lastly, next slide, plan for the kind of future city you want and take action. So if you heard the many people who were talking before me, they are taking action. And if you're listening to this, you can take action too. If you want a city where you can bike, try biking and seeing what you can improve in your hometown. If you want parks, write to your mayor and say, I want a park. <laughs> If you have an idea to close off a street for a weekend, organize your community and make it possible. You as a citizen have the power to use your voice to make your city zen. Hehe, <laughs> get it. Anyway, I can't hear the reacts, but it was a fun. Anyway, with that, um, next slide. Let's make better cities for a better normal. Thank you, everyone. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, Keisha. I I don't even have time to sort of echo anything. <laughs> and, and, and I don't know, like uh, for those who actually know me and, or have heard me speak um, before this or moderate a panel, for example, in Make Sense TV, I'm usually quick to my wits, but <laughs> after listening to your talk, Keisha, I, I don't, like a lot of them, even there I see all of them resonated with me when I was looking at the photo of Edsa before, like, I mean, not so long before when there were still a lot of cars, buses, and people on the sidewalk trying to get to the buses versus the Edsa that has bike lanes, like protected, well, not entirely protected bike lanes, but at least dedicated lanes for bicycles and bicycle riders. It's just so different. And 
it just makes you think um well personally it makes me a bit frustrated angry sad but also hopeful that there are things that can be done um so keisha such a perfect talk to close all of these things um thank you so much for being with us here today i'm sure this is not going to be the last so um keisha before i let you go if there's anything that um our audience our viewers can do for you and for the advocacy that you are standing for um can you tell us how we can support these even further yeah um so thank you so much and um you can visit life cycles ph um on facebook and you can join our community life cycles ph community if you have a spare bike you can lend so yeah thanks everyone excellent thank you so much keisha um we would love to hear from you especially on the comment thread section um i hope that everyone is still okay um, now that we are formally closing the show, um, I would love if you could flood the stream with hearts and like reacts to give appreciation and send some love to all of our speakers, to Keisha, to, to the ambassadors, to the entrepreneurs, um, and even our moderators who are very helpful um, in this event. Um, I literally wouldn't have done it with the team. And of course, a um, big shout out to our partner, City Foundation, um, who is helping us with the re reaction program, with the Y4SC program, all of these advocacies on youth for sustainable cities. Again, um, proper credits for them because without them, we, we couldn't probably do a lot of these things um, realistically, especially at this space and at this scale. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, I would like to say a few more notes. Well, starting with, I am very sorry for ending the webinar um, later than expected. I, I know that we said we will. It was just so jam packed. Um, we couldn't even um, address most of the questions that we put on the comment thread. But don't worry, we will get to them um, after the event um, and respond to your comments and questions on the thread itself. So. Um, on behalf of the Make Sense team, um, of course, again, in partnership with City Foundation, on behalf of all the speakers and panelists and moderators we had in this webinar tonight, thank you so much. If you didn't catch the beginning of the event, or if you just want to replay it because there was a quote that re resonated with you a lot, you can watch the replay on our Facebook page. Don't forget to follow the Facebook page of Make Sense PH alongside all of the links uh, that our speakers, entrepreneurs, and um, panelists have given to you in this whole event. So with the final note, I would like to remind everyone that we are still having the reaction program ongoing. So if you want to join or learn more about it, go to our website. Um, this is powered by both Make Sense and City Foundation. So thank you so much um, for tuning in up to this point. Um, if you have any questions, anything at all, comments, send some love through the Facebook live stream. But for now, I would like to say good night and happy dinner to those who haven't eaten yet. Bye-bye.